Visionary is proud to present his 21st season on public television. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. But you know what? It's just not true. I at least can hold on to something, that there's something, that, you know, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. There's no alternative. Every child has potential that we just can't know. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. The stigma of mental illness often can be as debilitating as the illness itself. It can extinguish the one thing that can motivate someone to get help, hope. The mission of Silver Hill Hospital in New Canaan, Connecticut is to shatter that stigma. They treat people with mental illnesses like people. People who deserve the help that will get them better. The hospital's clinicians are on the cutting edge of effective new treatments, from innovative methods of group therapy to new pharmacology. For Silver Hill, a vital part of any patient's recovery is regaining one's dignity and self-respect. Instead of a sterile psychiatric ward, employees here have created a home-like setting in the Connecticut countryside. While much of the nation's mental health system is in shambles, Silver Hill serves as a model for what is possible, compassionate care that offers hope for a better life. I think the idea of losing control of one's mental faculties and one's emotions is frightening. And so to see someone else who's struggling with that is frightening. Unless you've had that experience yourself of being mentally ill and losing control of your emotions or your faculties, it's hard to know that in that situation, there is still a person. I always look at homeless people who are shouting at nobody in the subway, and I've been there. I know that that person sees someone or something that they are communicating with. When people have a mental illness that is significant enough for them to be in a hospital, people view themselves as having failed in some way. If they have a substance abuse problem, they've failed to maintain sobriety. If they are depressed, they have failed to somehow pull themselves out of depression. You know, that feeling of wanting it to end, wanting it to be over, wanting the pain to go away and disappear, wanting to disappear myself, because I felt like if I started to talk about it, this hole would rip open and everything would fall out and I wouldn't know how to put it back together again. Nobody's pleased to be here when they come here. And so part of what we have to do is address that. We do it by the way we relate to our patients. We have spent a lot of time and resources on our environment. I was talking to Drew yesterday about the writing program. Everybody here believes in kindness, and they treat patients and each other and families with respect. I didn't feel safe outside. I didn't feel safe in my home, in my bed, in my head. <laughs> but I felt safe behind those doors. When I walked in to the acute care unit, that was at the point where I think I surrendered a little bit. I started to feel like I wasn't bad anymore and that um, I was just really in a lot of pain 
and that I needed that pain to be shared by other people because I couldn't carry it by myself anymore. If you are hospitalized in a cinder block building on the fourth floor at the end of a hallway with uh, fluorescent lights, that's one feeling. If you're hospitalized in a quite lovely house or in a quite lovely inpatient unit, people feel respected. They have some dignity left. They feel that there's reason for optimism, perhaps. This hospital was founded in 1931 by a doctor named John Millett. And the Silver Hill Inn in 1931 was more or less a retreat for people with, I would say, milder forms of a psychiatric problem. But over the years, as treatments came in, we had more and more effective ways of treating mental illness. The patient population changed we grew to be more and more of a psychiatric hospital. In 1985, one of my predecessors built what we now call the acute care unit. Healthcare in general has gone through an evolution. Many of the state's large institutions that help those with mental illness have closed. There is more and more consolidation and more and more belt tightening, really, within hospitals. Most of the small private psychiatric hospitals, like Silver Hill, have either folded or they've been bought up by for-profit hospital chains. We found a way to take advantage of the physical plant and location that we have to develop a financial model that works. And what we had is a beautiful campus with a number of different houses that the board bought up over the years, literally family homes. And they represented the opportunity for longer term treatment on our campus. We call those transitional living programs. The sad truth today, for your insurance company to pay for hospitalization, even for five or 10 days, you have to be very sick. And it's costly to take care of people in this condition. We lose money on every patient in the hospital because we give them the care that we would like to receive. The model is that really maybe 3,000 people a year come through, and another 300 who come to the transitional living, and that's an extra 30 days or so. But that's self-pay. It's a stretch for many families. But this self-pay group enables us to subsidize the acute care of the patients. PD. How are you? How crazy is this? <laughs> you look great. It was right before my 30th birthday. My son was 18 months old. And so I started seeing things, hearing things. I was insisting that aliens had invaded my son's body and just all sorts of conspiracy theories like the CIA. My last hospitalization was 10 years ago and it was not a very good visit. I attempted suicide. I had just gotten out of the hospital a few months prior, and one med was not doing it for me. I had severe side effects, trembling, and heavily, heavily medicated. My son was going out to play basketball, and my husband was taking him, and I stayed on the couch in my bathrobe in a drug-induced state. And as they left, I just felt, I'm doing everybody a favor. So I went and spilled 
all of my medications and was thoughtful enough to write a little post-it note, a uh, suicide note, and I remember it said something like, all done. And then like a frowny face with a tear, like I was done. With my first treatment, I felt 50% better. How are you? I'm doing good. It's oh. been a busy summer. I'm irritable. Like I'm a little, I'm a little off. So there are some stressors which are there all the time in terms of relationships, yeah, but you end up responding to them a bit. Dr. Kisilenko is a very kind, compassionate doctor. He doesn't treat me like a crazy person. He's a psychiatrist and a psychopharmacologist and a therapist and also specializes in ECT. So, uh, triple threat, quadruple threat. After my nine months of shock treatment, I ended up writing this book it feels really good to be on the other side of the locked unit and see what a great place this is. And the book was great, it was amazing. Such a, a cool portrait of, of what goes on. Some people say I'm 10 years in remission. I say episode free, I like that. I don't know, it just sounds like I'm free. I feel grateful that I'm still here and that I can try and use that experience to help others. At Silver Hill, we can treat the entire episode of illness. We can treat the acute phases in our inpatient unit, and we can treat the recovery phases in our residential programs. At the hospital level, about two-thirds of the patients have a dual disorder. That is, they have both a mental illness and an addiction. Very few facilities can treat both. A good department of psychiatry in a general hospital can manage, for example, a bipolar patient in a manic episode who has been abusing alcohol. What they can't do is provide the residential rehabilitation for his addiction to alcohol and for the bipolar disorder. Something similar happens in residential rehabilitation programs. They can certainly provide the rehabilitation after the acute detoxification from the drug of abuse as long as the patient doesn't have an acute psychiatric disorder, like a bipolar episode. I remember the day that we picked up Kevin at the airport. He was almost a year old. And the social worker at the adoption agency had warned us that a lot of these kids, when they come over, are a little bit withdrawn. And Kevin was so beyond happy. He was hugging us. He was hugging everyone at the airport. And little by little, as he was getting close to middle school, he was becoming more and more withdrawn. By the time he was 14, it was just a slippery slope downward. I was struggling with being gay, with mental health stuff. And I think it started really in let's say, eighth grade when I went to boarding school in Connecticut that my drug use started to pick up. I started acting out in other self-destructive behaviors. A teacher found razor blades in my pocket. It was in early January of 2014. I went to Silver Hill. My earliest memory of Kevin when he came to the Adolescent Transitional Living Program was his parents came to the door for a family meeting and I saw him run and hide behind the couch. He was so affect avoidant, both in himself and others. Mm -hmm. He absolutely had no tolerance for any emotion, either in himself or in his peers or certainly in his family. 
so it was avoid, avoid, avoid. This is so good. But there was something in him that was curious. And that curiosity is an opening to a, a concept that we use called psychological mindedness or reflective capacity. And he became interested in himself. What made him work? I was a really sensitive kid and I don't think people realize that. I don't think I even realized that. We also went to the weekly parent classes that Silver Hill had. And I think we learned a lot at those classes. As a mother, I was willing to do anything and everything to help Kevin. And what they had to teach me was, it's not my job. It's not my job to control his recovery. That was something that Kevin had to do. Family involvement is so important for our patients. They're going home really without a lot of defenses. And if there's a very angry wife, husband, or partner to receive them, that could be the trigger that sends them right off the rails again. Well, that was a pretty intense family program. How are you feeling? It's interesting because coming into it, like I felt anxious. If the family member has gotten some education and support, that makes all the difference. A lot of times I'm fighting to defend Rich to family or to his family or try to explain him or, and in this atmosphere, people can truly see what Rich and I have and I feel like I don't have to explain a thing. Since being here at Silver Hill, the relationship between Rich and I has really changed. Coming in, I think I was still angry and I think that I blamed him. And in going through this four day program, I've learned that the disease and the mental illness are very different than the person. And in all honesty, I almost think like I've never seen this side of him. The ripple effect into the family and the maladaptive coping skills that the family adopt around the illness winds up being a function of trying to understand this process. And in every different family, it's different. So our job is a little bit of some detective work. So the illness started five, six, seven. What was happening in the marital dyad? What were the life events that were happening in the family? This is therapy group and we're using psychodramatic techniques. Justin's gonna do some work around his relationship with his father. Right, he's going to give us three different time periods that he's going to work on, three different issues. And each of these chairs represents a different time period. And so a couple things that we do during this. One is we do role reversal. We have Rich, who's going to play Justin's dad. And we have John, who's going to be Justin's wise mind. Wise mind is that compassionate part of us that we are working on accessing and then when we first start off, Justin's gonna be talking to his dad, and then they will reverse roles so Justin can hear it uh, from his dad's perspective, what he has to say to him. And the doubling may occur whether Justin's over here as himself, or, or Jane and I may double uh, Justin in the role of his father. So why don't you just give us the three time periods first before we right. move. The, the first one is when I was little, and, I, I, and my parents were married, and I had really horrible sleepwalking night, night terrors. And um, these, these really bad dreams where I get felt like something was chasing me or pinning me down and I couldn't breathe and I'd run around the house. Dad, I need you to protect me because I'm really scared. Reverse roles with your father. Dad, I've been having these horrible nightmares, and they feel real. I don't know what's going on. I feel like I'm in hell. I'm looking for you to, to protect me. Wake up. Wake up, kid. Wake up.
So I want you to reverse roles with wise mind. So wise mind, you're going to go there. Justin, you're going to become... You're now Justin's wise mind. And remember, you're Justin's wise mind today, right here at Silver Hill. What did two-year-old Justin need to hear in terms of feeling validated? You haven't done anything wrong. You're just a little baby. Can I double you as wise mind? Yeah. Okay. Your dad really loves you. He just doesn't know how to help you. And he feels powerless, but it's not your fault. Okay. Great, let's go to the third chair. You guys are doing a great job. Third chair here. Tell us how old are you and what's going on in your life? I'm like 41 and and um, and my daughter <laughs> my daughter was born and um, she she had a, a, a genetic condition and she had to have open heart surgery twice so you're 41 your dad's sitting right here you could say anything you want to him about about your relationship about what's going on what do you want to say to your dad? I'm glad you showed up, but I'm, uh, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. This is, this is, this is, this is one that I never, never expected to happen. So I'm a double you here. I feel really lost and scared and I really need you now. Okay, reverse rolls. <clears throat> I just really need your support. Double your father, stand behind the chair, and tell us what you imagine he's thinking and feeling now. My poor kid, you know, why does he have to go through so much shit? I feel so bad for him, because he suffers so much. He's such a good kid. I mean, he's, he's, he has so many problems. It's like his life is like a nightmare, and I don't know what to do to help him. I feel that there aren't many careers that you could have that are as challenging and as satisfying as what we do. And I do feel like we're pioneers. The science of psychiatry and psychotherapy is ready to burst. You didn't cause what's happening. You and I feel that we're helping the world to usher in a new age of the way we treat people with mental illness. My hope is that the next generation will be able to say proudly that they came to Silver Hill Hospital and got treatment for a highly treatable chronic illness. That's my hope. I'm on a mission, and I have the greatest colleagues in the world to help this mission, which is to say that complex chronic mental conditions are treatable. They're not shameful their problems and fighting to further that mission with my colleagues here is an incredibly rewarding experience. I feel that if I am truly going to continue to get better that I can't ever forget where I came from. And I don't want to forget. I'm not ashamed. I'm not scared anymore. When I first came into treatment and was depressed and, you know, wanted to die, you don't really think, okay, in 15, 16 years, you're going to have this totally different life. 
because I'm not supposed to have those things. I need to make something out of something so horrible. And I think it helps me in a way, maybe define why I'm here. I can help someone else know they're not alone. When you have been hopeless and trapped yourself and you find a way out to find that hope again, that's a beautiful thing. And that really is a lot of what refills my reservoir all the time. I know that recovery is attainable and sustainable. A lot of times when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, oh, well, I have a husband and two small children and a job and a house and a car. You know, how'd that happen? <laughs> pretty miraculous. I didn't do it all by myself. And I just have a lot of gratitude, you know, every day. Silver Hill has collected the data to prove its treatments work. In one follow-up study, 72% of patients discharged from the hospital's residential program for drug and alcohol abuse remained drug-free a year later. For The Visionaries, I'm Sam Waterston. Visionaries is brought to you through the generosity of the Anna Maria and Stephen Kellen Foundation, CoBank, the Catholic Communication Campaign, National Cooperative Bank, the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut, and Eco Serendip Villa and Spa of St. John, and also by Capital Impact Partners, City Foundation, HG Promise Foundation, and PNC Bank. Additional support was provided by the following.